Adam Broomberg, Ollie Channerin, we're here in Freud's house. Why? We're in Freud's study, actually. Um, it's a very famous study. We were invited by the museum um, alongside a lot of artists that they, they invite to somehow uh, respond to the museum and um, to come up with a project that can be housed here and somehow responds to its legacy and Freud's legacy. And we chose to concentrate on the iconic couch that's behind us that every one of Freud's patients lay down upon, including the Wolfman and, and, uh, and everybody we've all read about. Freud actually died in this room, on a couch on the other side of the room. And um, there's just so much history in this room. There's such a kind of presence of this man, obviously. this. And um, we, we decided to make a work which is a sort of play on the word analysis. Um, and we, as Adam said, we focused on his iconic couch. And we invited a group of forensic um, scientists who normally work with Scotland Yard. And they came into this room and they looked at it as a kind of crime scene. And they gathered DNA um, material from the couch. And we've, we've gathered this material, which, as Adam mentioned, is, is, is the traces of all the various visitors that have visited upon this piece of furniture, including his iconic, um, uh, his iconic patients, but also tourists and analysts and people come from all over the world to stand in this room and kind of imbibe hmm. the history. I think we should explain exactly practically what we're doing. So um, our forensic scientists gathered every hair follicle or skin sample or anything they could find on the couch. They then took um, what it's called SEM images, so they blew them up, you know, from 2,000 to 5,000 times. And they delivered those high-resolution images to us. And our kind of... Um, the only gesture we made was, because the couch uh, is famously covered in a Persian rug and has been throughout its, its active duty, um, and it measures two by three meters. We decided instead of showing just photographs of this forensic evidence, but uh, we sent those photographs to the best tapestry maker in the world, and they have re-rendered the results, the scientific results, as tapestries. And what we're going to do is place the, the, the tapestry, one of them, on top of the, of the couch itself. And obviously it's very you know, vivid, bright, colors as you've seen those Im those kind of images and I think that juxtaposition not only of a forensic science versus um, a, a, a different f form that's here also aesthetically that the, the kind of jarring nature of it will be interesting. It's interesting that you mention about the subjectivity of biography and the objectivity of science. Do you think we place too much emphasis or too much belief in the objectivity of science and the subjectivity of biography, we've now gone too far from believing that subjective experiences can be sort of valid to the person and that science has come to dominate the way we think. We can't do anything that doesn't have a scientific basis. I think as artists, what's lovely about being an artist is you're not beholden to that. You know, we're not academics. We're not creating a, um, a, a, a thesis here. And it, we can, our, our gesture can be a flawed one. And, and we're not gathering real scientific evidence. So the role of the artist is, is, is a very liberated one because we're not beholden to the systems of science. Why do you think artists still respond so strongly to Freud and Freud's legacy? He's been dead 75 years. A lot of his work, some's been, you know, continued to have force and some's been discredited. Why is he still so influential? He wasn't very interested in contemporary art, actually. And the surrealists really struggled with that because, you know, their entire thesis was based on psychoanalysis. But um, so, so it's interesting. It's kind of a one-way relationship. The art world is enamored by Freud, but he wasn't particularly interested in them. Saying that, he, he reluctantly saw Salvador Dali and was very, very impressed by him after a long session with him. Um, so I think that he, that's one exception to that. To that rule.
But I think Ollie's point's a very interesting one. So what is it that artists like then? Is it that he opened up a whole range of sort of, a whole irrational toolbox in some ways? Oh, I don't know, it's such a massive question. I kind of um, have to like really I think, think it's not just artists. I mean, uh, recently I just reread um, one of the last lectures that Edward Said ever gave was given in this, in this room. And um, it was thinking about or rethinking um, about Freud's last book, which was a meditation on, on, on the, the sources of Judaism and the fact that Moses wasn't actually a Jew um, and that his doctrine came from, from, from the Egyptians. And how does Judaism cope with that, that its genesis wasn't, in fact, Jewish? And Freud found that so interesting. And Edward Said kind of reactivated the text and made it, made it interesting for our, the political landscape that we're living in now. So I think his legacy you know, reaches in, in, in all these different um, areas, not just, not just the art world. They've got, if you go into the bookshop here, they've got a pair of slippers. They're called Freudian slippers. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, Freud was obviously interested in the things that we say that we don't mean to say. And I think as artists, our practice is really also about, you know, what comes out without meaning to. Um, and so, for example, we've done a lot of work with the British military and other armies we're very interested in, in the kind of the idea of the state and the power and the way that at times um, the state speaks and reveals things accidentally um, through, through its actions and through its words. With the project Ollie was talking about, we got ourselves embedded with the British military in Helmand province during the height of the war in Afghanistan. And instead of taking a camera, um, we took just a roll of paper. And so what Oli was talking about, this roll of the kind of the accident we're very interested in. So we went where ordinarily a photojournalist would be taken, where there was a sight of a killing or a suicide bomb. And instead of taking a picture, we unrolled um, six meters of a section of paper and, and literally exposed it to light and came back with an abstract, you know, non-figurative piece. Mm. Um, that was recently shown in the Tate Modern in a show on conflict. And our meditation was what do people actually expect of their witnesses, you know, their, their people who are acting on their, on their behalf in these war zones? What do you expect? What is suitable evidence? What is scientific evidence of a death or of a, a, a psychoanalytical patient? And again, we were just... It, it was just a kind of setting up a kind of hypothesis and presenting it in, in, in a practical, physical form. You've put yourself in positions where you probably enjoy it less. You've been to Afghanistan, for example. It must have been a really difficult experience. It was very scary, but it was very enjoyable because it was interesting. It's, uh, I was very curious about how war works. You know, I've, we've, we've all read about it our whole lives, but how does it actually work? What does it feel like? How does it function? And so just out of curiosity, I was very satisfied by that experience. And also, it's quite humorous. You know, war is, is, is quite, even though it was at the height of, of the insurgents, and we arrived during, you know, the, the most deaths that had happened during war, people are laughing constantly you know, um, and, and the mundanity of it was very interesting. And, and the choreography and the logistics are so fascinating to watch. That work, uh, The Day That Nobody Died, uh, was in this conflict time photography show at Tate Modern. And did you feel that it was, uh, that it sat well among the more documentary works that were there? I mean, it, the history of photography is all about being in control you know, about timing and framing, and that's, that's, that's what it trades upon. And I think we, in our practice, are trying to reject all of that and leave it as much as possible up to accident. And the more the accident is, is in power, the better the work is, really. The military have been an important part of your practice. Um, is it because you like this idea, as we mentioned earlier, about structures and 
maybe subversion of structures and routines and the rigmarole that goes with that and the way that artists can see through it or undermine it. It's interesting because when we went to Afghanistan with the British um, army, we didn't tell them we were artists. We told them we were journalists. And that was really important because as journalists, I think they felt they could control us, that we'd signed up to something that made sense to them. The artist is a much more chaotic figure, a much less controllable entity. And I think that the uh, idea of an artist in a war zone is a much more frightening place to an organisation like the military. But for, uh, for example, our, um, our show that's opening in a couple of weeks at Listen Gallery um, is also all about conflict, but we kind of, we started tracing it back to the source and we thought about the notion of autonomy, of when does a child who, whose birthright is autonomy, when does that, beca- when do you surrender that to power? At what moment in life do you surrender it? to authority. And uh, we were reading a, a very interesting piece by a philosopher, a German philosopher, who was educated in, during the Weimar Republic. And he tells a story about how he was at school and um, he, the, the head teacher said, which one of you boys wants to go and get me my stick today? And all the little boys put up their hands and said, me, me, me. And he selected one and the boy proudly ran off and brought back the stick. And the teacher said, now bend down and and whipped him. And the point of the story was that there was no logic to the punishment. It was just obedience to authority that was being imparted. And this philosopher suggested that that possibly was one of the reasons why the Third Reich was able to come to power because of the particular education system at that, at that point, which, which was solely about obeying authority. The way, the, the way that we work is through kind of talking with each other and arguing and fighting and kind of making up. And, um, you know, it's a process that goes on a kind of journey where we kind of set off from one place and we don't really know where we're going to end up. And so this story of the bullets really kind of captured our imagination because there seemed to be something quite, something quite hilarious about it. You know, it's almost like a Tom and Jerry cartoon where you have two you know, people shooting at each other and the bullets bang into each other and kind of mold. And, you know, we started thinking about slapstick and about the performance of pain. And um, one of the kind of important central tenets of slapstick comedy is the idea of the double act. You know, Lawrence Lawrence and Hardy, you know, the fat one and the thin one and the stupid one and the clever one and the, you know, and Adam and I have been working together for 20 years. And which one's the stupid one? Which one's the clever one? I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm the stupid one. I'm the stupid one. <laughs> <laughs> we're both the stupid one. Um, and we're both getting fatter. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we're a kind of double act. And in a way, we think about ourselves as a kind of, you know, our collaboration is a bit of an accident. You know, we sort of bumped into each other 20 years ago and we're still wor- working together. How do you think people should find their way into your work? If you had to, if someone were looking at your work cold the first time, what would you suggest to them they start thinking about? What things would you say are good sort of, maybe keys, maybe it's not the right word, but to your work? I think I, I hope that it's, it's not important to understand something. It's important to respond to it intuitively. So standing in front of... Um, Uh, one of these images of the fused bullets, you have a response to it immediately as an aesthetic object. And then there's a second layer, is when you understand what that object is, the the meaning and the kind of emotional impact hopefully grows. Um, So I think there's those two layers, is is the one to appreciate an object existing in a space, and and the other is when when you're slightly informed about what what it is um it, it grows we've also been thinking about humor in the gallery in the sp- in the kind of museum space you know i think people don't laugh very much in in museums and in galleries there's a kind of within the con- contemporary art world humor is, is sort of there's a kind of lack of humor in a lot of exhibitions and there's a kind of protocol um, and we, we set out to make a film for the show, which we want hopefully to be humorous and for people to go in there and for their response, at least their first response, to be to laugh. 
And I think that would be, that's the first achievement that we're hoping from the show is that people find it funny. Ollie often says this, and it's one of our kind of dictums, is that we're more interested in the real world than the art world. How do you find operating in the art market today? That's a really interesting question because, you know, we started off as photographers and we were working very much in a photography mode, working with a large format camera in very traditional documentary sort of environments, photographing prisons and psychiatric hospitals and the sort of places that um, photographers like to visit. And um, we realized that we were operating in a kind of public art form that had very severe limitations. Um, when we were publishing photographs in newspapers, it, it came with a whole lot of constraints that made it very difficult for us to say what we wanted to say and make the work we wanted to make. And the truth is, is that the art world is, for all its problems, is probably the most radical context that we can show our work. Um, it's the freest environment with the least constraints. And for that reason, we feel like it's the, that's why we locate our work in the art world rather than in some other sphere.